Tonight, breaking news as we come on the air, the shooting at a hospital, the suspect opening fire in the lobby. The shooting turning deadly in Concord, New Hampshire, and then the takedown, SWAT teams moving in. Eric Gutersky with late reporting and the images just coming in tonight. Also tonight, Israel's war with Hamas, another hostage discovered dead near the largest hospital in Gaza, stormed by the Israelis. This time, a 19-year-old hostage discovered after a mother of five was discovered yesterday. So where does this stand tonight? The effort to get the remaining hostages out. Matt Gupton with late reporting from Israel. Here in the U.S., the suspect in court today in the kidnapping and rescue of a nine-year-old girl in upstate New York who was found in the closet of a camper on the suspect's mother's property, what prosecutors have now revealed tonight. With Thanksgiving less than a week away now, tonight the new cross-country storm set to move in and quickly right across the nation. Just as millions get ready to travel, what does it mean for Thanksgiving itself? Rob Marciano standing by to time this out. Our ABC News reporting this week, the American classroom. And tonight, our investigation into one community and some school fountains families say have not worked for years. Students who have to rely on bottled water just to get a drink. Federal law does not require the majority of schools to test for lead. But what we found in the schools that did test, Deborah Roberts reporting. There is news coming in tonight about former First Lady Rosalind Carter now entering hospice care, what we've learned tonight. 24 hours after that scathing new ethics report on Republican Congressman George Santos that determined he spent campaign funds on trips to Las Vegas, his rent, his Botox, the new move tonight to expel him from Congress. The story of the hiker who died on the trail and the dog who stayed with her owner right by his side for several weeks. Tonight, how that dog is doing. Also on a Friday night, Dolly Parton, rock star. She promised a rock album after being inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Sting, Paul McCartney, Elton John all joining her. And tonight here, someone you met right here this week. What he showed us struck a chord. And what so many of you did. Who is our person of the week? From ABC News World Headquarters in New York, this is World News Tonight with David Muir. Good evening. It is great to have you with us as we near the end of another week together here. We do begin tonight with the breaking news, the shooting at a hospital in Concord, New Hampshire, an armed man opening fire in the lobby, multiple law enforcement agencies responding, officers locking the New Hampshire hospital down, a security guard fatally shot there, officers then moving in to take down the shooter. ABC senior investigative reporter Aaron Katursky leading us off with what we know so far. Tonight, shots fired outside of New Hampshire hospital. Yeah, shots fired at the state hospital. Multiple law enforcement agencies responding to the state's psychiatric hospital and the capital Concord. Officers securing the building, telling the public to avoid the area after reports of an active shooter. I have one security guard who was wounded. In the hospital's front lobby, police said a man shot a security guard who was rushed to the hospital and died. The shooter is down right now. Uh, he is on the ground. The gunman killed on scene. The scene remains active as one suspicious vehicle has been located. The suspect in this uh, situation is deceased. The authorities say the shooting was contained to the lobby of the hospital. There are no additional victims that we know of, David, and all the patients are safe. David. Aaron Gutierski with late reporting as we start this Friday night. Aaron, thank you. We turn now to Israel's war with Hamas, 42 days now. And tonight, the news coming in, the body of a second hostage has now been found near that largest hospital in Gaza, El Shifa Hospital, stormed by the Israelis this week. Last night, another hostage was found dead, a mother of five. There are new images tonight of the brutal fight. Israeli video claiming to show the destruction of a weapons production plant of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. Tonight, Israeli troops inside El Shifa Hospital again gathering evidence they say that Hamas hit a military headquarters underneath that hospital. Tonight, Hamas denying that claim and the striking satellite image here tonight. The toll on Palestinian civilians, new satellite images showing thousands of civilians walking through the devastation in northern Gaza right there, heading south where Israel continues to say it is safer. And tonight, where does this effort stand to try to get these hostages out? ABC's Matt Gutman in Israel again tonight. Tonight, the Israeli military continuing its relentless assault on northern Gaza, blowing up what they say was a weapons production plant of the Palestinian Islamic Jihad. And Hamas releasing its own video, 
Fighters targeting Israeli forces with rocket-propelled grenades, sniper teams firing from bombed-out buildings. The Hamas-run health ministry saying the death toll in Gaza has now surpassed 12,000. And Israel today confirming the bodies of two dead hostages were found near Gaza's Al-Shifa hospital in recent days. 19-year-old Noah Marciano, a corporal in the Israeli army, was buried today. It comes a day after Israel discovered the body of 65-year-old Yehudit Weiss, both found in the street across from the hospital, officials say. Hamas also releasing video of 86-year-old hostage Arya Zelmanovich, his family asking the media not to show it. Israeli troops are excavating what they say is a tunnel entrance near Al Shifa Hospital, searching the grounds for a third day. The extent of the tunnel network is being exposed. We're seeing blast doors at the end of the tunnel, so it's obviously a terror tunnel. After 42 days of fighting, much of northern Gaza has been laid to waste. This satellite image showing huge numbers of people trying to flee south. The few hospitals still in operation overwhelmed. So many injured, including these children, there's no place to put them but the floor. One wrapped head to toe in gauze. <laughs> this boy has face bloodied, saying, my parents don't know I'm here. I want to sleep and I'm cold. I can't stand. I just want to go home. Despite the catastrophic damage in Gaza, Hamas still able to lob rockets into Tel Aviv. Most of tonight's barrage intercepted and in Israel, pressure for a hostage deal mounted. Behind me are the families of the hostages. This is part of their five-day march from Tel Aviv. What they're saying is free everybody, all of the hostages, now. But that's looking increasingly unlikely. Israel's national security advisor tonight saying there will not be a ceasefire without a, quote, massive repatriation of hostages. The question is, what does massive mean? Let's get to Matt Gutman in Israel again tonight. You witnessed the families there trying to put pressure on authorities to do more to get these hostages out. But Matt, as you know, there are divisions within the Israeli cabinet about what any deal to release these hostages should actually look like. David, the current deal on the table, officials tell us, would see about 50 hostages released women and children in exchange for a three-day ceasefire for Hamas. But that division inside Israel's security cabinet, which you just mentioned, may be holding things up. A group of the ministers, we are told, want to accept the deal as it is. Another group is pushing for a much larger deal that would include all of the women and the children and their family members, including males. David. Matt Gutman in Tel Aviv for us again tonight. Thank you, Matt. Back here in the U.S. tonight into the case that made national headlines, the nine-year-old who was kidnapped and then rescued. Tonight, the suspect now in court. That young girl was found in upstate New York in the closet of a camper on the suspect's mother's property. But prosecutors have now revealed tonight. And here's Stephanie Ramos. Shackled and shuffling, the man accused of abducting a nine-year-old girl from an upstate New York park and holding her captive for two days, appearing before a judge for the first time. Guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. 46-year-old Craig Ross Jr. pleading not guilty to all charges, including rape and kidnapping. Ross's appearance, a stark contrast to that arrest photo taken after police swooped in and rescued the nine-year-old girl from a small bedroom closet in a camper on Ross's mother's property. State police telling us the little girl was relieved to see them. Was she emotional? She was very emotional. The nine-year-old vanished while riding her bike alone during a family camping trip in late September, sparking a massive manhunt with hundreds of law enforcement and volunteers searching. Police zeroed in on Ross after matching the fingerprint from a ransom note left at the girl's home to Ross's fingerprint from a previous arrest. Prosecutors today said they have one goal. To hold this defendant who's committed a heinous, terrible offense against a tender aged victim, we will hold him accountable and responsible. The judge ordered Craig Ross to be held without bail. He'll be back in court next month and his trial is scheduled for the spring. David. All right, Stephanie Ramos with us here tonight. Stephanie, thank you. Tonight, Alec Murdoch, the former attorney convicted of murdering his own wife and son, now reaching a plea deal in the state's financial case against him. Murdoch already serving two life sentences for murdering his wife and son. He is now pleading guilty to stealing millions of dollars from his clients, including from the family, the family's longtime housekeeper who died from a fall at the Murdoch home in South in Carolina. Line, Murdoch saying he agreed to plead jury. guilty after having, quote, a long summer. time to think about it. Tonight, with Thanksgiving now less than a week away, the new cross-country storm set to move in and quickly right across this country, just as millions of Americans, of course, 
are set to travel. Rob Marciano standing by to time out the storms and Gio Benitez on the travel picture tonight. Tonight, the start of what's expected to be the busiest holiday travel season ever. United says it'll fly 3,900 flights per day. That's three flights per minute. Delta is expecting to fly up to 6.4 million customers. American, 7.8 million. The busiest day to leave, Wednesday. With more people having flexible work schedules in a post-pandemic world, that Monday and Tuesday are gonna be busy as well. In Denver, this Southwest flight had to abort its landing this morning in the midst of heavy fog. Travelers in Philly today hoping for smooth sailing. Hopefully all the flights stay on time and we don't get weather, right? With AAA predicting more than 49 million hitting the roads, one bright spot for drivers, gas prices. The national average at 3.30 a gallon, that's about 40 cents less than last year. In Los Angeles, where a massive fire under Interstate 10 badly damaged the crucial transportation artery, Crews racing to complete repairs. Officials say all five lanes in each direction will reopen by Tuesday. And David, the airlines all say they'll be ready for this travel crush, but the weather is the wild card, and that could cause a slew of issues. David. Speaking of that wild card, Gio, thank you. Let's get right to senior meteorologist Rob Marciano tracking the storm set to move right across the country. Hey, Rob. Hi, David. The pattern getting more active after a quiet couple of weeks. A storm has been lumbering off the coast of California, now pushing in to San Francisco and Central California, and then also linking up with the front going across the Pacific Northwest. So some heavy rain and some mountain snow tonight, tomorrow, and then during the day on Sunday, we're looking at the potential for severe weather, Oklahoma City to Dallas, and then on Monday into parts of Louisiana and Mississippi. And then watch how quickly this rain stretches across the Ohio River Valley and into the Northeast Tuesday night, Wednesday. Wednesday, we could see wind gusts over 40 miles an hour flooding rain potentially along I-95. That's not good for ground or air travel. It does clear by Thursday, but Thanksgiving Day for millions across the north will feel more like winter than November. David. All right, we'll track it right through the holiday with you, Rob. Thank you. We turn now to our reporting this week on the American classroom. Tonight, an ABC News investigation into one community and some school fountains that families say have not worked for years. Students who have to rely on bottled water to get a drink. Federal law does not require the majority of schools to test for lead, but what we found in the schools that did test. Here's Deborah Roberts. Tonight, just 40 miles outside of Manhattan in Spring Valley, New York, finding safe running drinking water for some students is a daily battle. We don't have access to running water where you have a water fountain. For seven years now, some drinking fountains in the East Ramapo Central School District have been turned off after elevated levels of lead were detected in the water traced back to the school's fixtures. How long has this been going on? Since I was in the fourth grade. And you're a junior in high school? Yeah, I'm a junior in high school. Francis Galicia, along with 10,000 students in the district's public schools, either bring water bottles to school or rely on bottled water provided by the district. When it's hot, you know, they run out by like 12. And then after that, you're just dying of thirst. It might surprise parents to learn the federal government does not require testing for lead in schools that get water from public water supplies, which is the majority of schools. And state regulations vary. But when schools have their own water systems, they're required to test. And the results are eye-opening. An ABC News analysis of that data revealed of the more than 7,000 water systems required to test by the EPA, 77% of test samples had some level of lead contamination. 6% exceeded the EPA's recommended maximum threshold. Which leads to questions about water in aging public schools. Lead can be extremely harmful. It can cause brain damage. It can cause these irreversible long-term changes that can affect things such as behavior, attention, learning. Back in the East Ramapo Central School District, they tell us the bottled water they provide will offer a solution over the next year while they work on replacing the drinking fountains that students say haven't been operable for years. What do you want to see done? I want the water contamination to go away. I want them to prioritize the need for clean, accessible water. 
The New York State Department of Education says it is working with the school district to replace those water fixtures in the next year. We spoke with the New York Civil Liberties Union, who calls this years-old water problem a form of environmental racism that's happening in a district that's primarily minority. We contacted the school board and the school district about those claims of environmental injustice, but received no response to those allegations. David? Deborah Roberts reporting. Deb, thank you. 24 hours after that scathing new ethics report on Republican Congressman George Santos that determined he spent campaign funds on trips to Las Vegas, his rent, his Botox, the new move tonight to expel him from Congress. The Republican chairman of the House Ethics Committee has officially filed a resolution to expel Santos. That report finding Santos blatantly stole from his campaign. The resolution now sets the stage for a vote to expel him after Thanksgiving when the move to expel Santos will need a two-thirds majority to pass. When we come back on this Friday night, there is news coming in right now about former First Lady Rosalind Carter, what we have now learned, and the hiker who died on the trail and the loyal dog who stayed by his side for more than two months. Tonight, how that dog is doing. Tonight, we have learned that former First Lady Rosalind Carter has now begun hospice care at the Carter home in Plains, Georgia. It comes six months after the Carter Center announced that Mrs. Carter, who is 96 now, has dementia. Her husband, former President Jimmy Carter, who is 99, has been receiving at-home hospice care since February now. They are said to be spending time with each other, of course, and with their family. And we wish them the best, of course. Well, tonight here we're learning more about the hiker who died on the trail in southwest Colorado and the loyal dog who remained with her owner for more than 10 weeks. Finney is her name, a Jack Russell Terrier losing half her body weight, weighing just six pounds when they found her. Her owner dying of hypothermia. They were reported missing in August. Finney has now regained most of her weight and her strength, the story of one very loyal dog. When we come back here, Dolly Parton turns rock star. You'll hear it here first. To the index, Dolly Parton promised a rock album after being inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And tonight, it's out. Thirty classic rock hits, including Satisfaction, Stairway to Heaven, and Freebird. Sting, Paul McCartney, Ringo, Starr, and Pink among the artists joining her. When we come back here tonight, someone you met right here this week. It struck a chord with so many of you. Who is our person of the week? Finally tonight here, our person of the week. His parents believed in him. His teacher, his school believed in him. And it turns out, you believe in him too. <laughs> It was the moment this week so many of you responded to. Inside that room, Matthew Whitaker, who is blind, playing the piano since he was a boy. As a toddler, his parents noticed Matthew had an ear for music even before he could talk. They reached out to the Philemon M. D'Agostino Greenberg Music School, hoping he would be a fit. Dr. Dahlia Sackis, the music teacher. Here on the phone. He remembers you on that first day. Do you remember him? Oh, yeah. Someone that unique with that kind of ability. You know, children can do things, but not every child can do what Matthew did. This was Matthew at eight. Everybody Now at 22, Matthew is helping that school raise money for other children like him. My first piano lesson was here. My first time using brown research was here. You're here today. Because of that? Because of that? Because of the school. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That school, that teacher, a few of his favorite things. They tell us after our piece this week, the school heard from so many of you at home, donating thousands of dollars, from $5 donations to 500. One viewer writing, I was so moved at the whole journey that Matthew went through and the unwavering support of his family. Another with a message for Matthew, thanks for lifting me up. At that school, already the next generation of children practicing. And we will not forget the moment when we told Matthew, his teacher, who's been with him since he was five, was right there in the room. For Dahlia, Rhapsody in Blue, Matthew's Way.
Tonight, so many of you at home moved. And so we choose Matthew Whitaker. If you would like to help Matthew and his school help other children like him, you can go to fmdgmusicschool.org. I'm David Muir. I'll see you right here on Monday. Good night. Thank you for making World News Tonight with David Muir, America's most watched newscast.